Welcome back to the Crochet Crowd as well as Yarnspirations.com. I'm your host Mikey. Today we're going to do tapestry afghan work just like you see here. So what we're going to be doing today is learning how to do this process. This is different from regular grafgan work. This is called tapestry and I'm going to be showing you all the techniques involved from going from a graph to your project just like so. For your convenience this video has been divided into seven chapters. This is going to take you through the ins and outs of doing this type of concept. The photograph or picture that will be used in today's tutorial is just an idea. You can use anything that you wish and what we're going to be going through today is learning how to make those graphs as well. So in chapter number one we're going to do an overview. Chapter two we're going to review a picture. Chapter number three we're going to go through the yarn and supplies. Chapter four we're going to be making a graph together. Chapter five we're going to learn about the front and the backs of the graphs. Chapter number six we're going to do a yarn carrying technique idea and that is going to be a big chapter as there's going to be lots of ideas to share with you there. And then finally we're going to end up with chapter number seven of making a mistake on how to adjust on the fly. So without further ado let's advance to chapter number one and let's do a quick overview. So let's go through an overview and to discuss what is the difference between a regular graph GAN and also tapestry graph GAN. There is a difference between them and this here that you see on screen right now is a regular graph GAN. So how I know that's a regular graph GAN is that you see that each section that we have done here there, there is a different strand of string in order to do it. So you'll see that this gold strand over here was here and then there's another gold strand here. So every time you saw the pockets of color they were a different strand and if you look at it from a different point of view when you looked at it from here you can see all the balls of strands that were on here and that and then that's what fills it in. Now tapestry graph GAN work is different from that. So what we have here is that I'm going to grab an example here and this is a uh, starting of the letter S. So with graph GAN tapestry ideas is that this dark blue instead of it being a separate yarn ball on this side of the S and that side of the S and in the middle just like you see here the work is dragging the colors through. So if you look really carefully as I split things you can see that the light blue is being carried through the work and then appears here and then the dark blue appears underneath the stitches here. So if I turn this around see it's completely buried inside of the project just like that. So it's a really neat idea. This is tapestry graph GAN work. So instead of actually using different bobbins we're going to learn how to bury our colors in order to make shapes. Of the two types of graph GAN work this tapestry is much easier than doing this. You don't have to worry about so many balls of yarn in order to work out. But I will caution you this kind of work you should only roughly work with two colors. It just makes it a lot easier because you are burying the yarn. If you have to bury more strands under this you'll see that the uh, stitches will explode and you'll see those colors starting to really bleed through. So what I'd only recommend if you're going to do this concept using only two colors at the same time. So this is a, a much easier way to do uh, these kind of things whether you're putting a name of a child maybe in a blanket etc. than it is to do it this way. However this way also has its advantages. Let me show you another um, project where this is being used here just to show you the difference. So here is the catch away pillow. So you see that there is a blue line going up here. This is the same yarn strand or same bobbin that is being done through all that. You will look very carefully. Do you see any of that light blue traveling through here at all? No, that's because it's not tapestry graph GAN work. So this is a separate ball so we release the color and then we bring up the new one. Just like the white that's a separate yarn ball like so and then when you see the blue you see that there's no blue from this side carrying across there. So this is the difference between this kind of concept. So you have to determine for yourself is tapestry crochet the way that you want to go or do you want to go conventional bobbin way because if you want really clean lines and no color bleeding at all throughout your project you'll want to go this way. But if you're working with certain ideas where that's not an issue at all. So if I pull up the other example in behind you will notice here it does come through just slightly but if you use the right colors it's hardly noticeable and you'll still get a great look at the same time. So you have to decide what's right for you. So without further ado let's move on to chapter number two and let's review a picture. So in step number two we're going to review a picture. Could be anything. It could be stars. It could be anything that you would like. You just got to remember that the tapestry is that the yarn will travel underneath. So when you're coming from an outside color you're going to grab this color just because it's black here on the camera 
you can use any kind of color that you want to but the same yarn strand is gonna feed each one of these and fill in the spaces as you go across. Now when you're going to do this is that you wanna consider a few things. You wanna consider the line thickness. If these lines are too thin what happens on the graph is that they can get lost and they can become misshaped. So you wanna make sure that you get uh, your line thicknesses. Now if you're going to do it like I'm gonna show you later um, on how to make a graph I recommend the Arial font on Photoshop or any kind of print program in order to do up your font in capital letters more most likely and then you can get nice thick lines that relatively stay equal to each other to make it really quite nice. So what does that look like then when it comes to a graph? That's what it looks like. And so this is a program which I'll tell you a little bit more about later where this is the exact same thing thrown into this program and this program automatically makes this graph for you absolutely free. So it's a really wonderful opportunity to be able to kind of go from a concept that you may have in your mind to something like this. So with tapestry crochet you want to consider that only you do to use two colors. So you have a background color and then you have the color that you want to fill in just like you see here. So you wanna consider that the boxes are not straight up and down when it comes to this. Let me tell you a little bit about that. So in crochet the boxes are provided just like you see here and you'll see that the stitch is kinda right on top of each other. Well in crochet that technically doesn't happen and what it happens in crochet is that the stitches truly never sit on top of each other but they always come off to the side slightly. So they're never just stacked on top of each other like equal blocks. So one will be slightly over and then when you turn it to go the other way it'll slightly go back in the other direction. So it's truly never an up and down motion. It's more like a zigzag of going up and down like this. Okay, when you're doing that and you have to consider that. So you will see things that may stand out for you that it appears that it's wrong but that's just because the stitches don't sit on top of each other when they're going to um, work. And so you have to consider that. So the further back you get away from a project the better it looks. So you will see that here on the back. So let's look here. You will see that there's some blue. It's kind of indenting in but if you look at the same one on the other side See it's indenting on here. That's not a mistake. That's part of that whole concept of the boxes not being straight up or down. So what we have to do is that we have to figure out how big is this S really. So let's talk about size gauging and let's figure that out together because each one of us crochet differently so the answer will be different for each of us. So each box is made up of one single crochet. So when you're looking at it here let's just take a look. You got one single, one single and then four singles and then one, two, three, four, five, six. So these are all single crochets. Now whether your chart is this big or whether it's this big it's still gonna be the same on your project. The difference is is the amount of boxes per inch. So what we have to do is that I can't tell you what that answer is for yourself because every one of us crochet differently. So what you have to do if you're really serious about this and really want to get it right the first time is that you have to do a quick gauge of four inches across by four inches high. And then what you do, so you just single crochet and you make that square gauge. Then you're gonna take a measuring tape and you are going to measure in the middle of the square what does one inch equal. Okay, so you just lay it down over top and then you figure it out. In my case it's about three. Okay, so three single crochets equals one inch for me. So when I go to look at this a box of three will equal one inch. So when I'm looking at this S I'm gonna know that these from here to here is one inch. Just like you see. So the next three is one inch and the next three is one inch. So when I go to look at it from this perspective and I go back and look at the S as a whole I know based on the count of boxes okay from here to here. So let's count them. So every three. So you got one, two, three, four, five okay and I got a little bit of that so there's six. So I got six in a bit. So I got one, two, three, four, five, six. So every three boxes is, is about an inch. So this sample if I've done it right which I haven't, which I haven't measured yet should be about six inches. And look at that six inches right on. Okay. So you have to figure out what your, your gauge is. So each one of us crochet differently. So if you can figure out how many boxes are, are making up one inch you can figure this out. So how does that matter? I want to tell you a little bit about the welcome mat that I was gonna make and I'm gonna show you what I did with that.
So coming up later in this tutorial I'm going to show you this in more detail. So the reason why I had to figure out the size is that what if I wanted to make this as a welcome mat of 24 inches wide. So knowing that I crochet uh, three stitches per inch I figured it out that I need a certain amount of boxes in order to make this. So what I decided to do is that I took uh, the number three Okay, so I knew three boxes and I times it by 24 which is number of inches. So let me write that here. So I took the three boxes okay times 24 inches. So say I want a 24 inches mat. This will give me a total answer of 62 boxes. Hopefully that's right. So what I have now is that when I went to go do the program is that I took my welcome and I put it into the program and I told the program I want 62 boxes wide. And what that will do is that it will put this into here so that it's 62 inches wide. So from here to here when this is all crocheted will equal a total of 24 inches. Okay, so once you figure out how many stitches you can do per inch you can figure that out quite easily. Now the height is kind of subjective to me. I can start it anywhere in the project that I want to but my key is to look at where all of these are gonna be sitting in reference to where it is on the edge and to where it is when it's come to come together. So it's kind of a neat idea. So that's how you would figure out what you want to do. So if you wanted, let's uh, do another quick example something that's easy. Say you wanted a 50 inch blanket uh, that 50 inches wide. So you would say okay three boxes okay times you want it 50 inches okay that will give you 150 boxes. So what you can do is you can insert this into the program and say that you want it to be 150 big boxes wide and this will resize it. So when you're going to resize stuff like that just because it shows that you have two blocks right now that make up the letter it could be when it gets to 150 uh, boxes this could be up to four or five more uh, four or five blocks in a row to make up the words because everything will be a lot bigger. So it's kind of a really kind of a neat idea I think and uh, this is a really cool idea. So let's uh, begin and let's uh, move on to the next chapter of looking at yarn and supplies. So let's review yarn and supplies. You want to make sure that your yarn is going to be good enough so that it will bury in yarn just like you see. So the blue, dark blue is going through but this light blue is doing a terrific job of hiding that color. So you want to be very conscientious on the thickness of your yarn and you want to also make it sure that it's nice and tight. So I used a five millimeter size H crochet hook for myself when I did this because I knew that it would compress and it looks uh, uh, pretty good. So even when the uh, light blue is going through it's still staying compressed. So for these kind of concepts what we have to do is we have to consider uh, getting a tapestry needle to hide in those loose ends of when I started. Okay and I'll show you how to do that later. And then you're also gonna need a graph which you're, which you're gonna be marking as you go. So whatever you've decided to do maybe you wanna do an S or maybe you wanna do anything like a star or whatever you'll just need that. You recommend a pen to make notes and I'll show you what I'm gonna do with that later. And I also recommend a highlighter and uh, we're gonna um, show how to do that and you can highlight as you go to make it a lot easier for yourself. So yarn and supplies is pretty quite straightforward and uh, it's just a really kind of uh, a matter of getting started and having everything. Now because you're doing it in tapestry style you're not gonna end up with all these uh, all these little balls to work with. So you're technically because you're only working with two colors here you'll only ever use two colors at one time. So without further ado let's carry on and let's learn how to make a graph together. So welcome to making graphs. We can do it several different ways. Let's go through old school first. You can make your graphs using conventional graph paper. You can download this stuff online as if you want to. It's completely up to you. I'll provide a link in the more information of this video and where you can actually download and make your own graphs as well. Like just get the graph paper printed out and just you know fill in the spaces. So you can just trace anything that you wanted. So maybe um, you don't have a printer or a stitch fiddle or anything like that and maybe you wanted to take a welcome um, sign that I had before and let me just get that up for you. So what you could do is if you have something at home that you would want to trace you can just lay it down over top and then you can barely see it through there and just using 
your pen or paper or pen or pencil just highlight where this was on the graph and just fill in the blanks and you'll have to make decisions on uh, whether you're going to allow a portion of a square or just a completely cut it off just like so. So you can go old school and do your own graph paper. I highly recommend though if you're gonna do this way once you get everything filled in and done take a copy of it and use your copy as your working notes that I'll show you more about that later. But if you're more technical like me maybe you want a free program in order to do that and we're gonna convert a font or an idea into an actual graph using stitchfiddle.com. Let me tell you about that. So let's talk about making your own graphs using free technology like stitchfiddle.com. So stitchfiddle.com allows you to take an image and insert it into the program and it makes the graph for you. It's a really great idea. You cannot use it though for anything that's a licensed copyright like Disney and everything like that. You can just use it for stuff that you make or whatever. So just make sure that you keep it legal. So say that I want to make a welcome mat and I've typed the word welcome in Photoshop. I recommend Arial as the font for this kind of thing. You get nice thick lines and it's nice and clear when you go to do that. So you can do it in Photoshop. You can take any photographs that you want to like I would recommend kind of more like this and you can insert it into stitchfiddle.com. So what's gonna happen is that it's gonna come up with what it thinks that it's gonna look like. Now this is pretty awful isn't it? Don't panic if you see that. Sometimes different fonts, so this is what I used a different font before trying Arial and so you'll see that different fonts don't always work out so well. But don't panic if you get that because you can correct it. That's the nice thing about stitchfiddle.com. So let me show you what happened was once I switched over to Arial and this is what it came up to be. Okay, so you look at what's wrong. So the O looks wrong to me. Okay, and the M looks wrong. Everything else looks pretty decent to me. So what you can do is that if this is wrong for you, you can go up over to the side of the screen up here and do you see that these are the colors? You can tell how many colors it to use when you're making this. If you're doing tapestry, tell it two colors. So either, either it would be the background color or this. So what you have to do is that you have to click one of the boxes. So for example, say I wanna get rid of some of the black here in the M where it's wrong. Then what I can do is that I, I click on the black and then I click on the square that I want to um, sorry I click on the white and I click on the squares that I want to get rid of of being black and it will instantly make it white. So I can do any kind of correction. So this one here is white, this one here is black on this side. So I will go up, select the black and then change that one to black. So you can do that really quite quickly before you um, get everything started and then once you just clean it up a little bit so you can see how I took the M and it went from that to here by just making a slight correction. So you'll notice that one side it made the M really boxy. I didn't like that. So what I did for myself is that I made a few extra white up here in order to really form that M. So that's a wonderful thing about that program. So we talked a little bit about gauging on trying to get the sizing to be right. So let's talk a little bit about that. So in the program you have what you want and you import it into stitchfiddle.com. It says uh, to upload it you put it in and then it will give you a really rough image on what it's gonna look like. It's then going to ask you how many boxes and it defaults I believe to 100 by 100. So it's gonna assume that this image is to be fitting into a uh, 100 by 100 boxes. You may not want that. Remember how I figured out that I wanted a 24 inch um, size for my mat. So 100 boxes to me may be way too big or maybe too small. So what I had to do is like I already talked about before is that I have to consider my gauge by measuring on the actual sample on how many stitches there were per inch. I figured out from my welcome mat that I would need a total of 62 boxes in order to get that this to fit properly. So because this image is a full image so if you can't see the outside box but it's actually it looks behind the scenes it looks like this. This is what the image actually looks like. Okay, so you have that in there. So this whole image is going to fit in. So that includes the space on the both sides of the letters. So I tell the program that I want this to be 62 boxes wide only and what that does is it resizes everything into position. And so when you go to auto regenerate you can see here that it's 62 boxes. So it goes 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 62. So I know that based on my own gauge and 62 boxes wide that I will have a 24 inch panel by the time that I get across this thing. So it's a really kind of a neat idea. So if I wanted a bigger uh, project then I already told you that if I want a 50 inch 
wide then I will figure out that three boxes equals one inch times the number 50. So I will need 150 boxes. So this will completely change this graph. So when you're going to do that it will make it look more compact and you will have more squares that will be filled in because it's uh, it the work is actually being exploded onto it. So this letter even though it would fit into a 24 inch if you're going 50 inches you're doubling almost the size of everything. So all the number of boxes would also I, I would assume double. So you wanna consider that when it comes to these ideas for different sizes. So this is one of those things where it's really important to take your gauge and what you know of yourself in order to figure that out. Now I know some of you are gonna leave comments here on, on YouTube for me to figure that out for you. You have to do this step. If you want to be accurate and you don't wanna you wanna take the guessing game out of this, nothing is worse than starting a project like this and maybe you're doing an afghan and realizing that your letters are way too big or maybe the afghan that you thought was gonna be an afghan ends up being a pillowcase. So you wanna really consider that. Take the time here to get that number of how many boxes that you want here in order for this to be a project that you only have to do one time. So it's kind of a neat idea. So let's talk about before we go any further on how to read this graph and uh, we're gonna go from that point. So whether it's a condensed graph like this where you have a whole name of anything that you won't want to put in. Maybe you wanna put in your child's name. You can do that quite easily. Also on stitchfiddle.com you can if you don't have access to a Photoshop program you can actually start and just click the boxes and make your own shapes as well. So that's something that you can do and then print that out. You have to become a free subscriber to it. It doesn't cost you anything in order to print these uh, when you're done. So that's not a deal breaker. So let's take a closer look at a larger version and let's talk about reading these graphs and I just want you to consider that maybe the yes is actually instead of an E it's an S and that there's more to this letter than what you see of just this S and I will explain that in just a moment. So below here what's gonna happen is that you'll have a solid color. You don't usually start with this changing right away on a chain. It's really quite difficult. So consider that there will be a border and this is just an idea for you to, to make your way across. So what's gonna happen is that we're gonna start in the one corner and we're gonna start here. Okay so pick this side to start and what's gonna happen is that you're going to follow the instructions and it doesn't matter if you're left or right handed. Okay and you're going to go across like so and you're just gonna follow it. So for example you have a total of one, two, three, four, five, six. You have six boxes. You can start writing on your, your graph if you want to and then you have a total of how many boxes? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven of white and then one, two, three, four, five and six. Just like that. So what happens is that you just follow the instructions going across and then once you get to the other side you come up and then you reverse and go back in this direction. So you turn around your project and then you start following the boxes going in the other direction. So in this case there will only be four and then how many is white? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I wanna count that again. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So there's gonna be eleven white and then how many is gonna be here? Okay, there's gonna be a total of four right here. So once you come all the way back and you follow the instruction you'll turn your project around again and then you'll follow up like this. So your entire project is working in a snaking formation going up. So whenever you uh, do a row you don't come back and start this next row here. You have to come back. So every other a row that you do on this you're going to be looking at the back side of the project and we're gonna cover that in the next part of your chapter of knowing the front and the back of the graphs because that makes a difference especially on letters because this is not a two-sided project once you have a letter or anything that matters of reading anything. So let's uh, move along to chapter number five. We're gonna talk a little bit about the front and the backs of the graphs. So chapter number five is about the front and the backs of the graphs. So you're going to be working in a snaking formation that I just covered in chapter number four. So what happens on here is that you can see that the letter S is starting to form on my project. So when I go to put it in you can see that it kind of matches exactly what the other the part of the S is. So every time I come across, so I'm gonna follow the instruction across and you see that I put it a border 
before I did that. So I went through and then when I did row number two like I explained here is that you have to turn your project but look what happens. The S is upside down isn't it? It's, it's backwards. So the back of this afghan has everything that you have but in the reverse. So if you have a child's name the back of the afghan the, the letters were all appear wrong. Okay, so you have to consider it's a one sided project when it comes to anything like this. So an easy way to keep uh, track of that is to grab some yarn and this is my own tip for you especially just for you and um, this is what I highly recommend that you do. You're gonna grab different colors of strands. You're gonna grab two of them and what I would strongly recommend is that on the graph you're gonna say okay I'm gonna say this is green and then I'm gonna say on the other side this is pink. This is just an idea of colors. And what I'm gonna do when I do my first pass across I am going to put in my stitch marker in the side that matters. So this was green when I did the first pass and I'll do this in the example that when we go to work on it. So this is green and then the other side is pink. And the reason why this is important is that when we go to start things like this we don't always understand the writing and that we don't see enough of it to always know what is backwards. And so what happens is that once you turn these afghans around and you start twisting up around you may not be able to recognize what is the front and what's in the back. So now that I've got it marked here green and pink whenever it appears like so I'm looking at the front side of the project. So if I'm working on the back side of the project like this see the pink is on the wrong side and the greens on the wrong side so I know I'm looking at the back. So if I'm working on a project and I can only see this much so far how do you know what's front and back, right? That's what I'm saying. So it's not until more of the letters get revealed that you can see that. So this gives you a good indication that whenever you go to turn around and you say hey you know what I still I'm on the right side this matches and this is something that you can remove later. So what's gonna happen in here is that these kind of ideas as you carry the yarn across if there is more letters like it was in the word welcome Remember how I said if there's more uh, letters maybe there's an M. I will just carry the white or the, the dark or the light blue underneath and I will continue on to the E and then I would and then hide it again continue on M. So I just have to come in and out. So when you're working on these and the colors just go in and out of each other but they're just carrying along like so. But it becomes to a fact where you have to know when to stop. And so I'm gonna uh, share a little bit about uh, that in just a moment. So here's my welcome and I put a red box around the welcome just like you see here. So if I was to do the S like so you will see that there's light blue. But do you see any light blue right here? L let me pull it apart. Do you see it? It's not there is it? Okay. But you see it in the middle here and you see it here but do you see it over here? No. So what I've determined is that with this kind of concept is that all of the light blue if, was, if this was to be light blue will just follow the shape of where it's appearing. So the light blue never carries out to areas where there's nothing there. So this would be like a dark blue area. So I stop the light blue here instead of continuing all the way to the edge. So if you're doing anything like that you just want to be uh, keeping that in mind. So for example when I had the S Okay, and I have light blue. You don't see anything here. So the light blue technically stopped here and then when I was ready for it the next time I brought it up and then it continues on and then I stop. So I only take this color as long as I need to without filling in areas that it doesn't need to be in. But there are exceptions to that and let me tell you a little bit about that too. So here's the graph and I put it in a large box and two little mini boxes. But do you notice that this line here kind of equals the same line? So I have a choice. When I'm doing this kind of concept and I'm just doing my dark blues and then this is light blue let's just say for example. When I get up to here I could literally bury this yarn under and then start this one and carry it completely up like so. I could do that. Right? So that's something that you have to decide. So you may have just to decide just to stop the blue here and then when you get here you just start a new piece so that you have a new section so that none of this gets anything in between. Because right here you will have a lot of solid blue and then you will just have one line where it appears just ever so faint that it may appear out of place. So this is the decision that you can do when it comes to these ideas whether you're going to uh, make these yarns separate or you're gonna keep it the same. Same thing with here. So when you were doing here and you're going all the way across you could just carry it all the way across and continue to do this and then come back and then finish it and then do it again 
and just uh, keep on going or you could have just done this as separate pieces. So you want to keep this in mind when you're doing this. So in the letters what happens is, is that if you look at it from this perspective is that we're doing the letters and like so and then we're burying them and then we're bringing it back and then we're burying them and we're bringing it back. So you want to really consider when it comes to the heights and anything like that really what do you want to do when it comes to the height because the height you can definitely use different yarn balls but in the same line I'd recommend that you just all keep it the same. So it's something that you have to consider and something that I think that as you get more experience you'll become to understand that even more. So let's uh, without any further ado let's talk about carrying yarn techniques and let's move on to chapter number six. So welcome to the yarn carrying techniques and what we're going to do is that we're going to go through a number of techniques and we're also going to start reviewing a diagram in order to follow. We might as well use a real example here in order for you to follow along. So what's going to happen is that the next I just created a section here. So this is the first section underneath where it appears. I would wrong, uh, strongly recommend that you never ever start off with the, the chain actually changing color midway through is a real strong pain. So let's uh, begin. So remember what I had already in the last chapter is that I put the on this side that this was green and this side is pink. So using your uh, just loose ends of, of other spare yarn I want you to put a stitch marker in that matches that. So you could have different colors just make sure you record it. So if you have like red yarn instead of green you can say red and blue and etc. And the other side it says pink and I'm gonna put pink on that side. And I'm doing that so that I can always identify what is the right side and what's the back side of the project. Okay, so front side and back side of this. So that I know where I am with the S at all at any one time. So I haven't actually technically started to put the S but the S I'm going to start the graph right here. So I'm just gonna move along and I already recorded that I have six of this color, seven of this color and six. So what I'm gonna do in the first part of this is that I'm gonna show you how to bring on new yarn and how to hide that in and then we're gonna start with that first. So let's start off with the starting point of uh, starting and changing yarn over techniques at that moment. So following the chart it says that I have six boxes right in the beginning that is the background color which is gonna be the green. So I'm going to continue to single crochet. So I'm gonna chain up one first. That's the starts of a new row and then I'm gonna go in the next in the first six but that last one before it changes over is the one that you need to pay attention to. So every box prior to transitioning to a new color always has to have something slightly different. So this one's slightly different and this one and then anytime you change over and I'll show you. So the first six get green. So one and two, three, four, five and this is six but do not finish six. You need to not finish six. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna bring up your new color. So what happens is that if you go to finish six, let's just say for example I finish six. This loop is the top of the next stitch. So if you finish it this and then add then the next color the top of that stitch is gonna be a different color than the base of the stitch. So just think about it like a house. Okay so the color doesn't match, the, the roof doesn't match the walls. So you wanna make sure that you backtrack and you get to that last one. So let's just do six again. So I'm gonna go in and pull through and hold it. And now I'm gonna change to the new color. So without doing any kind of knots just leave an extra long tail. I want you just to pull the loop through and finish that. So with tapestry we're going to hide the yarn underneath the stitch work. So you're gonna hide not only the green yarn because green is gonna be out of the picture for a bit but you're also gonna hide this red one because it's the new one and it's the straggler. You can bury that in at the same time. So it said that there was seven boxes here of this, of this red color. So we're just gonna go in to the first one okay and then you make sure that these two yarn strands are down on top of it and you pull through like a regular single crochet and through and you're going to keep those sandwiched underneath the stitches right in the so that it doesn't appear on the back or the front it's right inside the stitch. So we have seven. So I just did one and I keep bearing those as I go. So two and three, four, five, six and seven. So this is the seventh before changing over to the next color which is green again. So when this is the last time if I was doing more words I will carry over the red 
so I get to the next word. So say it was the word welcomes. Then I will carry the red over until I get to the E for welcomes. Okay with the with an S. So I continue to carry that color through. However, if this project at this point is finishing up here and this color does not, the red doesn't appear anymore between now and the border, I will stop the red. So th in order to do that, this is what you have to do each and every time you stop a color. Okay, completely. So you have to move it forward. So you might as well take that straggler of the yarn that you buried at the same time and you might as well cut that out now. Get rid of that. Just don't cut the good string. Get that out and bring this red forward. It has to come forward. If it doesn't come forward, it's not gonna be in the right position for you the next time. So the remaining of these stitches according to my diagram is that there's gonna be green. So I finished that stitch with the green. So I, I, did you see what I did? I didn't even say what I did. So the green is trapped underneath the stitch work and I'm just picking up the green and I'm finishing that stitch. That was the seventh. So the red is now finished completely. So I'm gonna leave it in front and I, re and I just continue just to finish the rest of the stitch work going across and there should be a total of six. So do you see what I'm saying with that red is that if you were to continue using that red, you would have buried that under until you saw it again on your graph. So you wanna continue to do that but if it's not gonna appear anymore, it has to be on the front side so that when you turn this around, that color is ready for you to be on the back. This straggler that's holding out right now, you wanna just pull everything nice and taut. Okay, don't over tighten it and then you can just snip it right down inside and that will be buried underneath, underneath and you never have to worry about that. So let's move up to row number two. So in row number two, we just simply turned our project around. And so you see that the pink strand is on this side and the green strand is on this side. So I know that I'm looking at this project from the back side now. Okay, so you're just following it in a snaking formation. So it says the first four boxes are green. So here's what we need to do is that we need to think about this because what happens is that the yarn of this color appears two boxes prior to where it's sitting. So do you see where the red is sitting here? It's gonna appear earlier. So we have to consider what we need to do in order to do that. So we're gonna move up to the next section of what happens when you need to bring your yarn earlier than what it is in the row below. So in this part of the chapter, we're going to somehow get our yarn strand to go over but the problem is, do you look at it? It's gonna, it's gonna bleed through. It's gonna be showing a really terrible tail. So if you have a situation like this where two boxes are earlier than what it was in the row below, that's not a deal breaker. It's really good. So let's uh, get started and it says that there's four boxes. So let's do that. So we're gonna chain up one first and we're gonna do the first four. Remember the final fourth we never finished. So one, two, three and four. Do not finish four. Here's the thing. If I grab this red right now and I go through, look, it's dragging across the back. Do you see that? So we have to get rid of that. That's gonna be there but you can get rid of that. So what you're gonna do is that you're just going to drop the green out of the way and you're gonna lay it down on top of the line. This is tapestry crochet. So you're going to go into the next one but when you go into the next one you wanna make sure that not only are you going into the stitch, not only are you keeping that on top but you also keep the yarn that traveled across on top to get stuck underneath as well and you're going to crochet the number for 11 times. So one and I'm gonna just go into the next one and again I'm just going underneath that stitch plus I'm grabbing, grabbing that traveler at the same time so that it's getting stuck underneath that work instead of being dragged across. So instead of that line just being visible, I just hit it underneath the stitches. Isn't that neat? So I'm gonna carry on. So the green just keeps on going with me. So it's total 11. So I got two already. So I got one. So this is three and four, five, six, this is seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven. So I can't finish that eleventh, okay? But this is the last time I will be using red but if I was carrying on with red for more, for more letters then I would just bury it like I did with the green and if you're completely done with it, move it in the front, get it out of your way and finish it with the green. 
and then how many do we have to do? It says we have to do a total of four. So I have one, two, three, and four. So when it appears like that, all you just have to consider is bearing that yarn in. So if I look at it from the other perspective, I'm now looking at it from the right side. I showed how to bury that yarn so that you don't have any strands that appear to be out of place. So what happens is if the color appears to be really late. So let's uh, talk about that. So at this point, I'm gonna go ad libbing now from just to show you some more techniques. So right now, the red is finished here. What happens in the diagram is that if it starts here instead. So are you gonna drag it all that way? That's the, that's the real question, right? So let's uh, think about what we're gonna do with that. So let's just uh, start up our green and we're gonna just go across and I will stop just before that red begins and I wanna show you what we can do. So right now, the green, okay, the green right here is showing us that um, we're gonna carry on across. So if the red doesn't start over here, all of this is gonna be dragging across the project so that you'll see that particular strand or will you? So what you wanna do is when you go into the red, not only do you wanna go into that stitch, so let me finish that green. So not only when you go into the red, but you also wanna grab that same yarn strand and take it with you. Okay, so when you're ready for it to appear, it'll be ready. And so not only do you go into the stitch, but you go around that yarn that's gonna be traveling with you and we're going to single crochet that into position. So you can just drag it with you and take it with you as you go, just like this. And when you're ready for it, you can just magically have it appear. So let's just say it's gonna appear in the next one. So I'm gonna just drop the green and now I can just grab the red and I'm gonna pick up the red and now the green is gonna go down for a little bit. Like so. So this is kind of a neat idea on being able to, to do that. So instead of having the yarn appearing to be dragging, I just have it buried under the work just like you see here. So let's just say for example, I, I turn around and the green is gonna start here but it's all the way over here at this point. So how do I get that green to start much earlier? So you can do the same kind of technique of just bearing things as you go as, as you do that. So let's just do the first two as red. So let's just chain up one and one single crochet in the first and next one. So now I'm gonna drop the red. So now I'm going to take this, okay, and it's dragging all the way across. So I can drag it as long as I want to. But the key trick is not to have uh, too much um, be, uh, for it being too loose. So I'm gonna go into the next one and I'm not only gonna trap that, that red one, but I'm gonna trap the green all the way until I get to that green space that you see. So I'm continuing to go everything and I'm continuing to get that green into position. So you can see that it does still have a traveling line up when you did that kind of thing but sometimes you have to do what you have to do. Okay, so you will see that it's slightly there but that's something that you can't avoid if you're doing anything like that in a project. So let's uh, figure out how to be able to um, um, just finish off your yarn. So let's just say for example we're done with the red like so and what I want to do is that I just simply just trim it and I'm gonna grab a darning needle and what I wanna do is I wanna pay attention to where I am sticking this needle. So I only wanna stick right underneath the stitches so just going right inside the stitch work itself and if you're gonna pop out, pop out in the same color. Then it won't be very obvious and you wanna go back and forth a total of three times. Now because tapestry you're only using two colors, you only really have two strings to worry about at this point because you're just dragging colors in and out of your project. So I showed you some examples of some boxes where they were, you could have decided that they wanted to be different um, strands. So when you're ending and, and stopping colors, you can see that you don't see any of it there. So you can see here, see I didn't bury it as I went. So that's what happens when you don't bury that you end up with these traveling strings but if you Barry, as you go, you can do a great job in being able to hide your stitch work at the same time. So what happens if you make a mistake? Let's just review that quickly in chapter number seven.
And finally, for chapter number seven, what happens if you make a mistake? Nobody likes mistakes, but it does happen. Sometimes that we miscount and you can uh, go on the fly. So for example, say the S, I actually have that as a great example. In the S, I actually think that in here, I went an extra one stitch too early here. So what I can do with myself is that I can just look at say, say you know what, I went one stitch too early. I, and this is where I made a mistake. So what I'll do is I'll just write on the graph on the additional box that I want to make in order to be part of the pattern. So if you're working on it and it doesn't look right at the same time, you can simply just look at this graph and just uh, you know fill it in. Just give it some extra boxes and just make sure you fill it in and just make sure you remember what you do. If this is too thin, you could have always just um, filled in an extra box here and just made those adjustments. So if you're noticing that you've kind of went off by one, you can either frog it back out and retry or you can just look at the thing and say, you know what, I made a mistake here, I added an extra box. So let me just put that in and just let me write that on my diagram and therefore I can adjust to that. So it's not a really hard concept to, in order to do. The whole trick is to being able to bounce in and out of the colors and make that yarn travel and of course make it work for you. So it's a kind of a really neat idea and uh, you'll see this coming up later on in other projects with Yarnspirations.com and this is a technique and this is using tapestry uh, graph gain work and until next time I'm Mikey on behalf of the Crochet Crowd as well as Yarnspirations.com. We'll see you again real soon. Bye bye.